I want to begin our analysis of logic by thinking some about set theory. If we look at the history of logic, there's a long history going all the way back to Aristotle and Stoic logicians, Aristotle developing a theory of quantification of all and some, Stoic logicians developing a theory of and, or, not, if. And those two traditions largely went in parallel, having little to do with one another until finally they were put together by Frege and Peirce in the 19th century. But for now, I want to focus on a different aspect of the history. 14th century logicians, such as John Burnett, spoke of sapotum, things to which linguistic items refer. And so, really for the first time, it became possible to talk about semantics in some way. That is to say, the theory of meaning, what logic actually represents. Antoine Arnaud and Pierre de Cole distinguished intentions from extensions in their 1662 book, A Port Royal Logic. But they spoke vaguely about extensions of terms. They talked about them as the things of which the term is true. And that leaves it unclear whether those things should be thought of as a plurality, just a bunch of things, or a collection, something like a set or a class. It was really Richard Waitley's 1826 book, Elements of Logic, that treated logic as resting on a theory of classes. George Boole took that idea and developed it into a theory in mathematics that was based on the theory of classes. Really, it was a series of theories because he couldn't quite get it right. At any rate, he saw logic as ultimately a theory of classes. And Georg Cantor developed a formal set theory in the 1870s. I want to talk some about that set theory because it's something that forms the background for contemporary logic and the con the background for contemporary mathematics in general. The key concept of set theory is membership. It's symbolized by the Greek letter epsilon. So we're going to read x epsilon y as x is a member of y, or x is an element of y, or x belongs to y. All of those are equivalent. Let's start with naive set theory. It's not an adequate theory, as we'll see. Nevertheless, it's still kind of the common currency. Most people don't really go beyond it to axiomatic theory unless for some specific reason they need to. And there are definite contexts that force us into that. But naive set theory is a good place to start. It has only two basic principles. It's one idea really is membership, being an element of. And the two basic principles, well, one gives identity conditions for sets, the other gives some existence conditions. So what are its two basic principles? The first one is extensionality. It says that x is y, is identical to y, if and only if, for any z, z belongs to x, if and only if, z belongs to y. In other words, it says that x and y are the same set. They are identical if they have exactly the same. Something belongs to one of them, if and only if it belongs to the other. So it simply says, sets are identified by their members. X is identical to Y, if and only if they have the same members. Something belongs to one, if and only if it belongs to the other. So let's talk a little more about extensionality. It says that sets are identical if they have the same members. Now, that right away marks sets off as distinct from concepts, distinct from properties. Why? because we don't differentiate concepts or properties by their membership. There can be two different concepts that apply to the same things, two different properties that have the same extension. That is not true of sets. You can't have different sets with exactly the same elements. Sets are differentiated purely by membership in them. So, for example, having a heart and having a kidney don't denote the same property. Those are different properties. They are different concepts but they denote exactly the same set of animals. Basically, if you have a pump, you better have a filter, okay, and vice versa. And so creatures with a heart are creatures with a kidney. In terms of membership, every animal that exists has a heart, if and only if it has a kidney. On the other hand, they are not the same concept. It's one thing to have a heart. It's another thing to have kidneys. Those are different things. That is to say, they are different concepts. And 
they are different properties. But it's the same set of animals we're picking out either way. The other principle is the principle of abstraction. It says that for any property P, there is an X, such that for any Y, Y belongs to X, if and only if P of Y. In other words, it says every property has some corresponding set that serves as its extension. We think of properties as true of certain things or applying to certain things, so we can think of things having the property. My shirt, for example, is actually very lightly striped. I'm not sure if you can see it, but striped is a property, and it's true of a set of things, the things that are stripes. This shirt has stripes, tigers have stripes, and so on. And so we can think of the extension of the term striped, or of the property striped, as, well, the set of things that have stripes. Now, it seems natural enough to say, for every property, there is an extension of that property, a class of the things that have that property. And that's what the abstraction principle says. For any property P, there is some set X, such that things belong to it if and only if they have that property. So, in short, it says that the extension of any property is a set. Sometimes people will treat that as one axiom, that is to say, talking about properties. Other times they treat it as a schema, that is to say, an infinite set of first-order axioms, where we think of P here as representing not directly a property, but instead some predicate, some open sentence with one free variable. And then we say the extension of every open sentence like that, every predicate that we can form in the language, is a set. There are other important concepts of set theory that we can build out of this idea of membership in the presence of extensionality and abstraction. So, for example, this guarantees the existence of subsets. X is a subset of Y, if and only if, for any Z, Z belongs to X, only if Z belongs also to Y. In other words, X is a subset of Y if all of X's members are included in Y. I don't mind 100 degree heat, but my iPad does. And maybe you'd be better off without the cicadas screaming in the background. The union of two sets consists of the things that belong to one or the other. So the union of X and Y is simply the things that belong to X or belong to Y. If Z belongs to the union, then Z belongs to X, or Z belongs to Y. A second important concept is the concept of an intersection. Something belongs to the intersection of two sets if it belongs to both of them. So something belongs to X intersect Y if and only if it belongs to X and it belongs to Y. The relative complement of a set is the set of things that belong to one and not to the other. So Z, for example, belongs to X minus Y, if and only if Z belongs to X and does not belong to Y. That's a useful notion. Often in naive set theory, we won't worry about this background set, and we'll just talk about the complement of a set as the things that aren't in that set. But we've got to be careful about that. As we'll see, there is no such thing as the set of all sets. And so it's dangerous to talk about complements in that way. We'll often do it, and it's not really a problem, as long as we understand that there's a well-defined set in the background. That's the role of X here. So basically, the complement of Y relative to X is the set of things that aren't in Y. Again, relative to X that are in X but aren't in Y. Finally, there's the concept of a power set. The power set is simply the set of all subsets of a set. So something belongs to the power set of X, for example, if it is a subset of X. It is just the collection of all the subsets of a set.